Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today, we are going to start talking about GPU programming for general purpose applications. Uh, in particular, we are going to start with the basics of the GPU software hierarchy, and we will define what's a grid, a block, or a thread inside the GPU programming model. We will focus on CUDA because that's the, let's say, the mainstream uh, GPU programming framework, but uh, anything that we describe or discuss today will have its counterpart in the OpenCL uh, programming language. Before we go into the detail, let me very briefly remind, remind you what we covered in our previous, previous lecture. We were talking about the architecture or we started to introduce the architecture of CMD processors and GPUs. And uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, I told you that at the end of their course, this course, you would be able to understand uh, the, uh, in, the, the, the most inner details of this uh, NVIDIA A100 GPU. Remember that it's a GPU with 108 cores in the um, A100 version. And remember as well that inside the um, A100 core, the GPU core, we can identify different functional units that remind us uh, what a CIMD processor is. It's not the only thing that GPUs share with CIMD processors in the way that we explained them in the previous lecture, because also uh, GPUs use bank memories that we also uh, introduced um, in the previous lecture. As an example of bank memory, uh, in, in this uh, A100 uh, core, we have this uh, shared memory. Remember as well that I showed you this slide where we see the evolution of NVIDIA GPUs since 2009, actually CUDA started like two, three years uh, before 2009, in 2006, 2007, we had the first CUDA enabled GPUs. And since then we have seen a um, very fast increase in the number of fun functional units and uh, the processing or the computing power uh, of the GPUs in gigaflops until this A100 architecture from 2020. But these are not the only uh, NVIDIA GPUs these days, because exactly uh, this week uh, we learn about the new uh, GPU from NVIDIA, which is the uh, Hopper architecture. As you can see in the slide, uh, significantly significant increase in the number of functional, functional units and significant increase in the peak gigaflops with respect to the previous generation, the uh, Ampere. Uh, it's named Hopper after Grace Hopper, who was an American computer scientist. And um, this architecture uh, includes several new uh, innovations that some of them uh, we will discuss over the course of, uh, of this uh, course on heterogeneous systems. But here you have the block diagram of the H100, uh, where you can uh, see up to 144 uh, cores in the full blown. Uh, GH100 chip and up to 60 megabytes of L2 cache, as you can um, see here in the middle of the block diagram. Uh, observe as well other uh, innovations and changes with respect to the previous architecture. For example, the uh, PCI Express interface has been updated to the uh, 5.0 version. The uh, previous generation was 4.0, and now we have um, the, the, the 3D stack memory that is connected to the um, GPU, in, it, it's now HVM3, uh, it was HVM2 uh, in the previous generation. We will uh, talk later in this course about um, specific uh, innovations in this architecture. Um, I just want to give you a very brief uh, announcement and introduction to it. Um, this is the H100 core where uh, same as in the previous A100 core, we can clearly identify uh, execution units for 32-bit uh, integers, for single precision floating point, for double precision floating point, and the tensor cores that also have some novelties. For example, now they support 8-bit uh, uh, floating point uh, multiply and accumulate operations, and actually they support two different uh, formats of 8-bit um, floating point. Remember, even though uh, the, this uh, new architecture looks fascinating, we already know the basics of how it works. Uh, remember that GPUs internally use warps 
and um, they execute instructions for different warps in an interleaved manner, in a fine grained multi threaded manner. The good thing of using this fine grained multi threaded uh, um, technique is that it's possible to hide uh, long latency operations, such as accesses to the uh, external of chip memory or um, uh, some uh, execution of instructions, for example, transcendental functions that are executed in the special function units and they usually take longer than uh, the execution of integer of uh, or um, 30 uh, or floating point um, multiply accumulate operations. Remember as well that the way we execute one warp on the GPU hardware on in, inside the GPU cores also depends on how many functional units we have. And actually we talk uh, about the execution of uh, instructions from warps, same as we talk about the, the, the execution of SIMD instructions in SIMD processors as um, uh, in, in a way that we can exploit the parallelism in either time or time and space, depending on uh, what's the number of functional units that we have. And when we talk about the functional unit, we mean all execution units that uh, um, are available to execute a specific instructions in the SIMD hardware or inside the GPU core as well. We may have several of these functional units, same as we have just seen in the uh, core of the H1, H100 GPU. Um, but yeah, and some of these uh, functional units have, uh, the, the different functional units may have different purposes. Here we have, we can see functional unit uh, here and we also see a different one here. And also uh, we have the partition register file uh, where we have like the, 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 the whole amount of registers that at the beginning of the execution are partitioned and assigned to the different threads that are going to run inside the GPU core or inside the CMD processor if we are talking about uh, CMD processors. And remember as well that these um, um, combination of uh, registers assigned to individual threads plus the corresponding uh, execution units inside the fu different functional units um, where instructions from different threads are executed are called a lane. So every time we talk about the um, internals of the GPU core and how the warp instructions are executed, we would be talking about every single thread of a warp being executed on a SIMD lane of the GPU core. And as I said before, depending on how many um, how many threads we have inside the warp and also how many uh, execution units we have in, in each of the functional units, we can have uh, more or less uh, threads uh, being launched and executing instruction at the same time. In this uh, slide in particular, we assume that the number of threads per warp is 32 and we assume that the number of lanes is eight. So what that means is that in every single cycle, we can start the execution of one instruction per eight threads because we have eight lanes. One cycle later, we can start the execution of the next eight threads of the same warp. And um, that would apply to the different execution units that we have in our functional units that we have in our GPU, like load units, multiply, add, depending on um, the, the, the internals of the um, GPU core, they might be uh, integer or uh, 32 floating points, um, uh, 64 bit floating point, et cetera. Okay, after very briefly uh, reminding you what's the um, introduction to the GPU architecture that we covered in our previous lecture, let's start with uh, GPU programming. As I said in the beginning, um, the let's say most uh, popular and dominant programming language in GPU programming is CUDA, but OpenCL is also widely used and it has um, certain advantages. The fact that it's a uh, cross-platform or multi-platform, the same code can run on different devices like NVIDIA uh, or AMD GPUs, for example. And in the end, all concepts that we will explain for CUDA also apply for uh, the OpenCL programming language. Remember as well that um, one uh, important thing uh, when it comes to using GPUs and CD processors is uh, programming them in a way that is uh, 
um, like relatively easy to handle by programmers or by compilers. Because uh, remember this paper from Fisher uh, in ISCA 1983, where he said that one of the biggest disadvantages of CIND processors was the difficulty uh, to map data and to map the data structures onto the hardware and to map the computation onto this hardware. One good thing of the uh, general purpose computing on GPUs these days is that the learning curve and the difficulty uh, to program these CIND processors has, has been much alleviated. As I may have mentioned uh, before, uh, the GPU computing era started sometime in 2006 or 2008, and it um, uh, became quickly very popular because it was a way of democratizing high performance computer. Because now anyone could have in their commodity PC, a GPU uh, pro uh, pro providing a large amount of gigaflops uh, that were not available uh, a few years back. Uh, yeah, and actually using these processors uh, makes sense for many important workloads because many uh, important workloads use uh, exhibit inherent parallelism. If we look at matrices, if we look at images and image processing, or more recently, we look at deep neural networks, we will see that there is a lot of uh, inherent parallelism and in particular a lot of data parallelism that is uh, best suited for GPUs architectures. And, um, but as I said, and as we have seen in the previous slide, programming is not for free. I mean, this is not for free. We need to learn how to program this uh, new architecture. The good thing is that this programming model is now uh, much more uh, easy to learn than what we had uh, in the past in, uh, let's say, uh, old CMD processors. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have to rethink the algorithms and how we implement them on this uh, new hardware. And uh, still there will be uh, some bottlenecks. It's not uh, just uh, exploiting the available parallelism and uh, everything will be, um, will be fine. There will still be some bottlenecks over the course of this course, we will talk about data transfers between CPU and GPU, even though uh, PCI Express VAS or NVLink uh, have uh, improved the bandwidth of communication between CPU and GPU um, over time, that is still far from the DRAM memory bandwidth, from the bandwidth to the external uh, of chip global memory, it is a name that we will normally use in the context of GPU. And, um, and, 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 and even so, the bandwidth of this external memory is also going to be um, uh, important bottleneck because, of, because it, it's in the end uh, small as compared to the large processing power that the um, internal uh, GPU cores have. Okay, and we are going to start talking about the basics, as I said, the basics of the GPU software hierarchy. But before that, let me recommend you one book, Programming Massively Parallel Processors by Professor uh, Wemey Hu and David Kirk. Uh, in, the, in the slide, you see the uh, cover of the third edition released in 2017. As far as I know, there is a new version a new edition in preparation, the fourth edition, and hopefully will be uh, public, will be released uh, sometime soon in uh, this year. As soon as I know something, I will, I will let you know. And also another important reading, another important recommended reading, if you're going to program GPUs, you will have to go uh, to the CUDA programming guide from time to time to clarify, for example, how different instructions uh, are uh, used, what's their syntax, uh, and, and, and so on. It's um, definitely uh, a key uh, reference for anyone programming NVIDIA GPUs. And if you go to this programming guide, one of the first uh, figures that you will see is this one, is the uh, this um, simplified representation of a CPU and a GPU for us to understand very quickly what are the key differences between CPU and GPU. They have different design philosophies, as you see, while a CPU has very few out-of-order cores that are super powerful by themselves, GPUs have 
many more cores that normally are in order and fine grain multi-threaded and, um, and much less powerful than each of the individual CPU cores. The biggest advantage is that we are going to have many, many of these uh, small in order cores. And this way we are going to be able to exploit uh, a lot of parallelism. Um, besides the processing elements themselves, we also see uh, differences in terms of how much area or how much space in the die is um, devoted to control, to um, internal um, on-chip caches, etc. We usually uh, we, we we will normally see much larger caches, for example, uh, in CPUs than in GPUs, even though the cache size as we have seen in the A100 and the H100 GPUs have increased, uh, their size have, has increased a lot in recent years. Okay, very uh, basic start of how to do GPU computing. Remember that we are talking about an heterogeneous system, so there is no GPU replacing a CPU completely. We assume that the GPU is a coprocessor or an accelerator that works together with the CPU. So computation is going to be offloaded to the GPU when the CPU decides. And we have three main steps in this process. First of all, especially in the case where we have discrete uh, GPUs, which are the uh, most uh, powerful and also most popular ones, uh, we'll have to transfer the input data from the CPU memory to the GPU memory. And once this transfer has finished, we can start the execution. We can start using the GPU cores. On these GPU cores, we run one function and the name of this function is kernel, GPU kernel. After the kernel terminates, we normally retrieve the results. So read the output results from the GPU memory to the CPU memory. So this is the, let's say the third step in this uh, generic uh, representation of the uh, of loading to GPU. But how do the programs look? Let's take a look at the traditional program structure. Uh, we have uh, CPU threads. We are going to assume that we have CPU threads running on the CPU, and we also have GPU threads running on the GPU, uh, executing GPU kernels. We normally uh, start the execution on the CPU, where we are going to continue executing those parts of the program that are sequential or modestly parallel, while the massively parallel sections of the code will be executed on the GPU. So we have maybe one or maybe very few threads running on the uh, host, probably executing, as I said, uh, serial or sequential code. And at some point, we will reach to the massively parallel section. And what we do, or what the CPU main thread does, is launching the kernel onto the device, onto the GPU, to start the execution. The way of launching this kernel is by using a syntax like this. Notice that this is kernel A. These are the input arguments here. And here in the middle, we have what we call the execution configuration. This execution configuration essentially determines how many GPU threads we are going to use in the execution of this GPU kernel, and also how these GPU threads are grouped. Because as we, will, as, as, as we are going to see today, GPU threads are not uh, simply launched onto the hardware. They are first grouped into thread blocks, and um, these thread blocks uh, when it comes to executing the code on the GPU hardware are going to be mapped on the GPU cores. So here you see more or less a representation of, it's called a grid of threads that run on the GPU to execute this kernel A. And these threads are grouped into thread blocks as you uh, can see here in the figure. At some point, the kernel will terminate, the, return, uh, the control returns to the CPU, to the um, uh, main thread in the CPU. And sometime later, we will reach another massively parallel section. And now we have to execute this kernel B. Again, we will use certain number of blocks, each of a certain number of threads 
we launch the kernel and start the execution on the device or GPU. This is what we call the, or inside the GPU, what we use is what we call the uh, SPMD programming model, single procedure or single program, multiple data programming model, where uh, each processing element executes the same procedure, except on different data elements. And they can eventually synchronize also, we will see, um, in the using barriers, we call them sync threads um, in, in CUDA, as, uh, as we will see soon. And, um, and essentially, uh, each procedure is a different GPU thread inside the GPU. Each of them executes their own instruction stream, execute this, the same program, but they operate on different data. So um, they have uh, this ability to work on different data, and they also have the ability to execute different control flow paths. And that's something that we described in the previous lecture. We talk about the conditional execution. We talk about the use of masks and how these masks allow us to have different threads belonging to the same warp to diverge and execute the corresponding control flow path. That's important. It's useful in terms of programmability, but it's also uh, important and necessary to understand that this divergence is not desirable if we really want to maximize the performance of our programs. We will talk about that and we, we will have time to uh, go in depth uh, on, uh, on how to optimize code in this course. So the SPMD programming model is the programming model of CUDA and OpenCL. Um, besides this characteristic of using multiple uh, threads, multiple procedures, executing uh, the same program on different data, uh, another key, characteristics of, of, uh, key characteristic of this programming model is that it is bulk uh, synchronous programming. What that means is that at the end of one kernel, there is a global or coarse grain synchronization. And what this means as well is that if we have two different threads or two different blocks executing on our device, we uh, cannot be certain about when these blocks are exactly going to be executed. The only thing that we can know for sure is that at the end of the kernel, when this coarse grain synchronization happens, all thread blocks of, um, uh, that have executed the kernel terminate. And at that point, we can assume that all the previous computation has been done. As I said before, and as we uh, have just seen, the host still controls the execution of the program. And this host, that is typically a CPU, allocates memory on both the CPU memory and the GPU memory, moves data between the CPU memory and the GPU memory back and forth, and also launches the kernels as we have just uh, discussed in uh, the previous slide. And the device, which normally is a GPU, executes the kernels. Uh, it's important to highlight here that when we talk about the device, we will be talking about the GPU because, for example, the OpenCL programming model, the OpenCL programming language, is not only uh, useful for GPU computing. You can also use OpenCL to program FPGAs, for example. And in that case, the device is not a GPU. The device is an FPGA. But the programming model and the way of programming the system is uh, exactly the same. Um, in the, when, when it comes to uh, executing a kernel, the whole group of threads that we launch onto the uh, GPU hardware is what we call a grid. So that's the total um, uh, group of threads that uh, execute a kernel. This grid in OpenCL is called ND range, but it's uh, essentially the same. As you know, the threads are grouped into thread blocks, and these thread blocks in OpenCL receive the name of GUAR groups, but they are exactly the same. Inside one block or inside one GUAR group, we can share memory, we can uh, co easily communicate using the, um, the, the, the shared on-chip memory that each of the GPU cores have, and it's also possible to synchronize. We will see how. I already mentioned the barriers and the sync threads. And finally, the lowest level of this hierarchy, we have the threads or work items in OpenCL that are 
those uh, uh, those procedures, those threads, software threads that are going to be mapped to a SIMD lane and are going to execute their own procedure, their own uh, program. So going back to, well, uh, continuing with the traditional program structure in CUDA, uh, we are going to see a little bit of code already. We'll have function prototypes for the CPU functions, they will, they will keep uh, being the same as usual. In the C function declaration uh, can be, for example, this one float serial function with its own uh, arguments. Uh, when it comes to declaring the kernels, it's a, a little bit different because in this case, we have to use this uh, global qualifier that will uh, tell the compiler that this uh, function prototype corresponds to a function that executes in the um, GPU, so a GPU kernel. But we would still have a main function that will run on the CPU. And as I said before, the CPU thread will have to allocate memory on both the CPU memory and the GPU memory. And notice that you can uh, clearly see what this uh, means. CUDA malloc is a malloc, so it's an allocation, memory allocation operation that happens on the uh, GPU, and this corresponds to the CUDA library. Then we also have a specific functions to transfer data between the host and the device, between the CPU memory and the GPU memory. And this is the uh, most common one is the CUDA main copy um, library call. Then we need to define what's the execution configuration, what's going to be the number of threads per block, and what's going to be the total number of blocks that are going to uh, compose or grid, and then we call the kernel using the, uh, we, we, we use this uh, syntax with the execution configuration, configuration here uh, as we have seen before. And finally, when the kernel terminates, we transfer the results from the device, from the GPU memory to the CPU memory, also using this CUDA main copy. As you can see already, the difference, the key difference between these two is that the uh, destination uh, array in this case is this D in, because this is a copy that goes from the host to the device, while here the destination is H out, that is allocated in CPU memory because this transfer goes from the device memory to the host memory. Actually, this direction is um, indicated with another parameter that we have here at the very end, and you're going to see it more clearly in the next slide. Um, <clears throat> every time that a kernel terminates, the control returns to the CPU. At some point, the CPU might decide to launch a new kernel of load more computation onto the GPU hardware. It might be the same kernel. There are um, some programs that are iterative and call multiple times the same kernel, or it might be a completely different kernel. Uh, inside the kernel, uh, as we will see, uh, automatic variables are transparently assigned to registers, to the um, uh, internal registers in the GPU core that are assigned to each uh, thread running on this core. We also have the shared memory. We have already uh, talked about this shared memory before. It's a sort of a software managed cache or a scratch pad memory where the programmer or the compiler can decide to place some small arrays or some variables that are going to be shared because uh, that they are useful to all threads or many threads belonging to the same thread block. And we also have the intra-block synchronization. Threads belonging to the same block, which is also with, with and, and they are also threads that will run in, uh, on the same GPU core can synchronize. And, um, and this synchronization is used uh, is done with a barrier and the syntax for this barrier is these sync threads that you can see here at the bottom of the slide. So going into some more details of the CUDA programming language for you to start becoming familiar with the syntax of these different APIs or, or uh, library calls, we have this uh, CUDA malloc to allocate um, a certain number of bytes um, and, 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 and that are pointed by this D in, that is a pointer previously declared. We have the mem copy. In this case, is a copy host to device. So from the main memory of the CPU to the memory of the GPU. Um, and the destination is um, 
an array is a pointer in the GPU memory and the source is a pointer in the um, CPU memory. As you uh, are already guessing for the transfers to happen from the, CP, from the GPU memory to the CPU memory, we'll have to change this uh, parameter here to device to host. This is the syntax of the kernel launch as we have seen before. After terminating our program, we obviously want to deallocate memory. We want to free memory space so we can use this uh, CUDA free. And also if we want to make sure that one kernel terminates from the, uh, and uh, because the, for example, the C one CPU thread wants to really know when a kernel runs, a kernel terminates uh, on the uh, GPU, we can use this explicit synchronization, CUDA device synchronized. And this is important because the, uh, whenever a CPU core launch, a CPU thread, launches a kernel to execute on the GPU, this execution is asynchronous. That means that after launching the kernel, um, the CPU thread, it, it's free and can continue doing other operations, same as it could simply wait. Um, but um, if this thread eventually wants to know exactly when the uh, GPU kernel has uh, terminated, it needs to use this CUDA device synchronize. And after the CUDA device synchronize, uh, it can start, um, for example, using the values and the data generated uh, on the GPU side. Okay, by using these uh, functions and, and using these library calls, we can start writing our first uh, CUDA code example. And actually this is the host code example. <laughs> it's not the main function, but this would be like a, function that is being called by the main function and we call this one back at you can see that it's a vector addition and uh, and here we have uh, three arrays a b and c a and b are the two input arrays and c is the output array and the arrays are of size n elements in particular they are uh, floating point uh, um, operands and at the very beginning you see how we declare the pointers a b to, to arrays A, B, and C in the uh, global memory of the GPU, and we allocate memory for these three pointers using CUDA malloc. In this case, because it's uh, as simple as a vector addition, we allocate the same amount of memory for uh, the three arrays. But now, and assuming that the uh, arrays A and B already exist on the CPU memory, we can transfer from this uh, uh, memory area pointed by array A, by pointer A in the, um, in the uh, CPU memory, we transfer from the host to the device uh, to move the entire input array A uh, from the CPU memory to the GPU memory. And we do the same using CUDAM and copy for, for array B. Um, then we will have here, uh, we would uh, have here the kernel launch as uh, we are going to see in a couple of slides. But after terminating the kernel, we will have to copy back data from the GPU memory to the CPU memory. That's why um, now the um, destination pointer is this C that uh, points to an array allocated in CPU memory and uh, transfer now, as you see, is from device to host. After uh, moving back or as after copying the results, we can uh, deallocate, we can free all the memory previously allocated on the uh, uh, GPU memory. So the vector addition is our first programming example. It's a pretty simple operation, as you know. The only thing that we know is the element-wise addition of two arrays A and B, and we store the results in an array C. In this uh, most uh, simple implementation that we can think of, what we do is assigning one GPU thread to each element-wise addition. So this, uh, this um, thread here is going to be thread zero and gets assigned this operation, thread one, and so on. But now we know that, well, we know that the whole uh, set of threads that uh, execute one kernel is called a grid, uh, but uh, we need to have a way of assigning these threads to the GPU cores, because even though we may have you know, one million threads, 
um, in the end, we won't have 1 million uh, SIMD lanes available every time for the execution of these 1 million threads. So we need a better way of assigning threads to the GPU cores. And that's why we define uh, or we group threads into blocks or thread blocks or work groups in the um, OpenCL programming language. So for example, in this um, very uh, toy representation, uh, what we <laughs> can do is saying, okay, these two, these four threads here uh, compose block zero. These four here are block one, this is block two, and this is block three. And the computation that is assigned to each of the blocks is the same computation that we previously assigned to the different threads. But now we know that threads in block zero are going to operate on these parts of the arrays. Uh, block one will operate on this part of the array, block two and block three. And um, using thread blocks has one key advantage is the fact that the hardware is free to schedule thread blocks. This is what we call the transparent scalability. Imagine that you have a kernel grid, you have a kernel, you're going to launch a grid of threads and these threads are grouped into thread blocks. In this particular case, all grid contains eight thread blocks numbered from zero to seven. And now imagine that our uh, GPU or device has only two processing, it has only two GPU cores, right? These uh, that are, uh, you, you can see here in this uh, simplified representation. So we will need to have a scheduler inside the GPU core that decides when to schedule and start the execution of the thread blocks in the kernel grid onto the cores of this device. And one way it might be this one, for example, we start the execution assigning block zero to one of the cores, block one to one of the cores. When these two finish, the uh, corresponding cores are free so we can schedule new thread blocks, like for example, thread block two and thread block three and so on until we terminate the execution of the kernel because all thread blocks have been executed onto the available hardware. By the way, uh, here you can see that we are doing some sort of, um, um, let's say linear assignment of blocks to cores. This is not guaranteed at all. We cannot assume that if we have a device with two GPU cores, the first two blocks to be executed will be block zero and block one, and they are going to be executed concurrently. We cannot assume that at all. As I said before, this is a book synchronous programming model. So we can only assume that one thread block belonging to a grid, belonging to a kernel, has finished the execution when the whole kernel has finished. So in this point here. The uh, good thing of the transparent scalability is that if now our device has more cores, like for example, this one that has four GPU cores, we can, or, or the scheduler can easily allocate different blocks to different cores. And in this case, we would have four different thread blocks running at the same time on the available cores running concurrently. When these four threads finish, or when one of them finishes, the next block will be a schedule. For example, when thread block zero finishes, block four gets uh, a schedule. And as I said before, each block can execute in any relative uh, order relative to other blocks. We cannot assume any uh, order in the execution of blocks. Okay, now let's see how we launch a grid. We have already seen the um, um, syntax very briefly, but now we are going to see it with a little bit uh, more detail. Threads <coughs> in the same grid execute the same function that is no, known a kernel. And a grid can be launched by calling a kernel and configuring it with the appropriate grid and block sizes. Um, so this is what we call the execution configuration. And as you have seen before, in the kernel call, we will have the number of blocks that are going to be launched on the GPU hardware and the number of threads per block. Normally, these numbers are going to be a function of the um, amount of data that we want to process. For example, in the vector addition kernel, we have n elements and we want to assign one element, one element wise addition to each of the threads. So if uh, we decide, for example, to use 512 uh, threads per block, we will have to launch 
as many blocks as needed. And this number is determined by the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a total number of elements and over the number of threads per block, this division will give us the uh, total number of blocks. And the kernel call will be something like this. So now we know that uh, in this part of our host code, what we will have is the uh, definition or calculation of the execution configuration and then the uh, kernel call. And how do the uh, internal uh, internals of this uh, kernel look? How does this kernel code looks? We already saw this in the uh, previous uh, lecture, actually. Uh, remember, uh, we, we, we compared this uh, simple CPU code with the CUDA code, which in the end is very, very similar, not complex at all, because uh, what uh, we have is here is a access to the global memory to read uh, one element from array A, one element from array B, and then we add them and store the result in array C. The <coughs> only the key difference between the CPU code and the CUDA code is that in the CUDA code, we are essentially unrolling the for loop, assigning each of the iterations to a different CUDA thread, and then uh, each CUDA thread, each thread has an own identifier that will tell it where exactly to access. And this identifier can be obtained based on the uh, block index, because as you have seen before, thread blocks are going to be numbered. And also inside each thread block, the threads are also numbered. Um, uh, just to uh, start uh, summarizing what we uh, have seen, um, the, the, the kernel is uh, preceded by a keyword or a qualifier that is called, uh, that is global to, uh, to, to indicate uh, to the compiler that a specific function is a, a GPU kernel. Inside the GPU kernel, we need to use some indices to uh, identify what's the thread block or what's the thread inside the thread block. And it's also <coughs> important to know what's the block size as well. So we have uh, a special keyword building um, variables that are um, uh, here to identify the block index, the block size, and the thread index inside the um, thread block. So the code would look like this, right? And, and here what we have is the calculation of the global index that tells each individual thread what elements of, in this case, array A, B, and C, it has to access. Observe that we calculate um, this index by using the dimension of the block, the block index, and the thread index. So now um, this i tells every single thread what are the elements that need to be accessed. There is one small thing that we uh, have to um, include, have to add to this uh, simple back at kernel are the boundary conditions. We have to check whether we need to use one thread or not, because um, normally we won't have a number of threads per block. So the, the, the total size of the input is not going to be normally a multiple of the uh, number of threads per block. So in this case, what we have to do is um, deciding what's the number of threads that we launch by uh, computing the ceiling um, of the um, uh, this uh, division here uh, where we, uh, obtain what's the number of blocks. So here you, you see that uh, we are, we want to use, for example, one, uh, five, 512 uh, threads per block, but we want to round up um, uh, the number of blocks that we launch to uh, a number of blocks with the corresponding number of threads that is uh, that expands the uh, whole uh, arrays of uh, any elements. And this uh, simply, the code is going to look like uh, these. Uh, inside the, the kernel code, what we do is obtaining the index and then checking if the corresponding index is still inside the arrays, is um, uh, smaller than n. Okay, so regarding uh, compilation, now we have written more CPU code or GPU code, we have to compile before we execute on the, the reunion system on the CPU and the GPU. So we are going to have um, C or C++ uh, code for the CPU, and we have CUDA code for the GPU. And these uh, codes are fed to the uh, CUDA compiler that internally 
uh, calls the um, uh, host compiler for the CPU code, and it will generate the host assembly, the machine code for a specific CPU, either an x86 processor or an IBM power processor or, or an ARM processor. And then on the other hand, we have the GPU code itself. Uh, the MVCC compiler, first thing that it does is compile it to an intermediate representation or a virtual ISA that is called PTX and is common to uh, all GPU generations. And then it, will have, it uses a device just in time compiler that compiles to the specific assembly called SAS of the uh, specific architecture, regard either an Ampere or Hopper or any other architecture. And then that code will run on the GPU. So um, we have already seen how threads need to access data elements in uh, input arrays, but the very first example we have covered is simpler one is the vector addition. <clears throat> and for this vector addition, uh, we are just using you know, like linear addressing the way that um, different threads are numbered and the way that these are indexed and these uh, different threads access the data structure is in a linear manner. But sometimes we may prefer to use uh, two dimensional organizations or even three dimensional organizations. And that would depend on the specific data structure that we are using. For example, the images, uh, they are two dimensional data structures of a certain height and a certain width. Here we have a very uh, simple image, let's say this uh, eight by eight uh, um, image is composed by 64 different pixels. And if we want to access the peak one pixel of this image, we need to know what's the row and what's the column where the specific pixel resides. For example, this pixel here is image zero one because it's in uh, row zero and column one, or this one is um, image one, two, because it's in row one and column two. But how are these images in memory? And that's something that we already talked about in our previous lecture. They are going to be linearized either with a row major or a column major layout. We are going to assume a row major layout. In the row major layout, the row and column of the image uh, tell us or can tell us what's the a specific memory address, memory position that the pixel, where the pixel resides because our image has a certain width. If we want to know exactly what's the address of uh, one specific pixel, we have to use, we have to multiply the, um, uh, the row index to, uh, times the uh, width of the image and then uh, add the corresponding column index. Um, so here we have like, uh, let's say a stride, a distance, between the start of one row and the start of the next row. And this stripe <coughs> is essentially the width of the image in this case, assuming that there is no, uh, we are not padding extra columns or something like that. So this element here that was element zero one in reality resides in the address zero times eight plus one being eight, the width of the um, toy image that we are using in this example, or this element here, is element uh, is pixel one, two, and it resides in the uh, position one times eight plus two or address uh, 10. So if we are using, <coughs> um, uh, so the, the, the way that we, uh, let's say distribute the computation uh, for this image um, across the different GPU threads or across the different uh, threads that belong to blocks that belong to a, a single grid uh, we would need to use the identifiers of the block, the dimensions of the block and the identifier of the thread inside the block as we have seen before. And uh, we can distribute the computation in this image uh, in this way, for example. And let's assume that for now our uh, thread blocks are of size four threads. So we could assign these four pixels to block zero and then these could be assigned to the rest of blocks. So, but if we take a closer look at the block zero, here we have four different threads from zero to three that are being assigned different pixels out of the group of pixels or the chunk of the image that was assigned to block zero. And if we want to exactly uh, know what's the 
uh, pixel that we are accessing with one specific thread from one specific thread block, we need to know what's the block index, the block dimension, and the thread index. For example, this pixel here uh, would be assigned to a particular thread. This particular thread is going to be thread one in block six. Actually, this is block zero, one, two, three, four, five. So this is block six. And this particular pixel is assigned to thread one of block six. So if we want to know what's the exact pixel, the exact memory position that this thread needs to access, we have to compute this address by using the block index, the block dimension that in this case is four, and the thread index inside the uh, thread block. And, 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 and here it's um, uh, address or element 25. But we can also have uh, two dimensional blocks. In this case, we have um, like, um, like we define all block sizes and all indices of uh, blocks and threads into dimensions. So here, this uh, could be block zero, zero. These are the rest of blocks. Uh, if we take a look at this thread block in particular, this is uh, thread block two, one. And um, inside each thread block two, one, we also have a, a two dimensional organization of individual threads. And for example, this particular thread or the particular thread that we assign to this pixel is thread one zero. So now if we want to compute or calculate exactly what's the pixel that is being assigned by, by um, one thread belonging to these two dimensional blocks, we have to calculate the row and the column for example, um, uh, for uh, this one here, we first need to take into account what's the block index in the y direction multiplied by the block dimension in order to, um, uh, to, to, to start where the thread block, the specific thread block starts, and then we add the uh, thread index inside the two dimensional block. And this way we obtain the column and in a similar way we obtain, so, sorry, we can obtain the row and in a similar way we obtain the column. So for example, this element here is in row zero, one, two, three, as we know, the way to obtain this row three is by using the block index in the Y dimension. This is block one. The size of the block is two in the Y dimension, block uh, dim dot Y is two. And, um, and the uh, pixel, the, 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 sorry, the particular thread that is assigned to the pixel is thread one. So this would be thread index Y zero, thread index Y one. And, uh, and same way we calculate the column. In this case, in the X direction, the, the, the index of this thread block is zero uh, and the uh, index of the, in the X dimension, the index of the thread assigned to this pixel is one. So this is the how we calculate the column. And once we have the column, we can have, and the, and, and the row, we can obtain the um, exact position or the exact address of one specific pixel of this image uh, in the memory. Okay, so this is essentially all for now. We will continue in our next lecture. Now we know how we can define um, grids of blocks of threads. We know how we can launch kernels to be executed on the GPU hardware. And we know how the individual threads in different blocks can access data that resides in memory. We have seen the example of the arrays in vector addition. We have also seen the example of the uh, two dimensional images. Once the, co once the um, code is defined and the thread blocks are defined and we launch the kernel, these thread blocks are assigned to GPU cores, as we have seen as well. And inside the GPU core, remember from the previous lecture, they are decomposed into warps. And these warps are these kind of SIMD units that are going to be um, executed or instructions for these warps are going to be executed onto the available uh, functional units like these uh, SPs here that are the um, you know regular um, uh, SIMD lanes that might be as we have seen in the, in the latest generations A100, H100, 
They might be for integers for, for 32 bit floating point or 64 bit floating, floating point. We also have uh, load and store units to access memory. We have others like these uh, special function units. And here in the GPU core, as you remember, there is a warp scheduler that goes to the instruction cache and says, okay, now I'm going to execute this particular instruction for this particular warp. I launch it um, every cycle onto the available functional units. If you want to uh, read a little bit more about the uh, contents of today's lecture, I can recommend your um, chapters one and two from the Programming Massively Parallel Processors book. And in our le next lecture, we will continue uh, with this introduction to GPU pro uh, programming and the, um, uh, yeah, how to write GPU software uh, by getting familiar with the memory hierarchy uh, of the uh, GPU and the different memory spaces that can be accessed by threads. Threads in the same block can access uh, same data that resides in the shared memory, the on-chip shared memory, but they can also access a of chip memory, the global memory, uh, where they can share data from, uh, with threads that belong to other blocks in the same grid or to uh, other uh, threads that will belong to uh, grids uh, that, that will execute later kernels. So this is all for today. Uh, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me if you eventually have any questions about the contents of today's lecture or um, um, yeah, the, the course in general. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>